Okay, let's begin. So good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the introduction of RSC Supported Technology Platform Series today. So I'm Jocelyn, I'm from ASTAR Research Support Center. And today we have Merexus with us, presenting to you on the topic biomarker discovery with their Merexus Ideal Technology. So I would like to thank our partner, Merexus, Doreen, Dr. G, Labi, and their invited guests, uh, Dr. Su, for taking their time to join us today. So before we start, do take a look at the webinar tip. So if you have any questions, feel free to click raise your hand icon if you wish to speak up or write them in the Q&A section by clicking on the Q&A button below. So just take a quick one minute to read through the slides. So just a quick brief introduction about Research Support Center. So basically we work on three key models. See the three thick colored lines on the circle. So first we provide a wide range of research consumables on our web store by simply search, click and buy. So besides consumables, we actually also offer scientific services by a variety of technology platform that is available on our platform. So via two main key models, which is first, search book use and inquire scope service. So with search book use, users can actually look for equipment that they require and book their usage, which can be either self-use or staff operated. So whereas for the inquire scope service, it is more specific and targeted in that the, tech, the relevant technology platform will carry out the appropriate service based on your experimental requirements provided. So in short, Basically, we don't serve just the ASA community. We also serve um, the academia and industry sectors as well. So just a quick overview. So from this slide, you can actually see the range of services that we provided. So we offer front end as well as back end support to these platforms. So we allow them to focus on their service deliveries to the customer's side. So now let me briefly touch on the national shared infrastructure platforms. So these are the recipients of the NRF shared infrastructure support grant. So first we have the Immunomonitoring Service Platform, ISP, focus, uh, uh, located within SIGN. So they focus on flow cytometry, multiplex soluble protein assay, and immunoinformatics. Then secondly, we have the translational a pathology consortium, in short TPC, it is based within IMCB. So they are in partnership with various pathology facilities across Singapore, focusing on in vivo as well as in vitro toxicology or histopathology services. Thirdly, we have the Singascope, bringing together the microscopy facilities from ASTAR, NUS, NTU, as well as SingHealth, making them available to the research community. And last but not least, we have SingMass, bringing together ASTAR as well as NUS mass spec facilities to the community as well. So here are some of the services that we support, that we partnered. So some comes from ASTAR facilities, while some are actually from the industry partners that we partner with. So do scan this QR code and let us know your feedback and thoughts about this webinar and what you would also like to see in the future webinars. So I will flash this again towards the end of this session so that you can actually take some time to fill in the survey for us. This is the next upcoming webinar that we have. It will be also the last webinar for this series of the year. So for those who have been with us since our first webinar, uh, we would like to thank you for your support very much. I shall now hand over to Dr. Jit to introduce um, Mirexus to give us a few moments for the switch. Thank you. Hi, Dr. Jit. Hi. Good afternoon, everyone. So welcome to the uh, this installment of the RSC um, uh, seminar, where we will really discuss the uh, um, how biomarker discovery 
uh, can be made uh, using the Miraxis IDEO technology. Um, so I'm Jit, uh, I'm the uh, uh, lab head of uh, the NUS non-coding RNA core facility as well as uh, the head of uh, external innovation for Merexis. Um, so today we have the, the sort of pleasure to uh, invite uh, Assistant Professor uh, Su Singyi uh, to um, share with us um, how tear fluid microRNA profile can be used as potential biomarker to predict uh, response to anti-VGF uh, treatment for diabetic macular edema. So I'll give you a bit of background about uh, my, my colleague, Singy. Um, she's the uh, uh, principal investigator of the uh, translational retinal um, research laboratory at IMCV. Uh, she's also a consultant ophthalmologist and the research director at the Department of Ophthalmology at NUH, uh, as well as a, uh, assistant professor at the Yonu Lin School of Medicine at NUS. Uh, she's very passionate about building bridges between the, the uh, basic science world and, and medicine, the clinical end. Uh, her research interests um, uh, you know, uh, uh, focus mainly on translational research for retinal surgery and therapeutics. Uh, Singy had published widely, uh, you know, both in the form of uh, book chapters, as well as um, uh, numerous research uh, articles in world-renowned journals like Nature uh, Biomedical Engineering, Nature Structural uh, uh, Molecular Bio, Lancet Global uh, Health, as well as others. Um, she has been awarded um, a lot of uh, um, grant dollars. You know, um, uh, more than $10 million competitive research funding. And last but not least, she's a recipient of multiple global and uh, national award. Uh, and uh, just name a few, last year, she was awarded the Young Ophthalmologist Award um, from the Asia Pacific Academy of Ophthalmology. So without further ado, let me hand it over to Singy to talk about uh, her work. Singy, please. Thank you, Jit, for the very kind um, introduction and for this opportunity to present my work here. Just want to check you can see my screen. Okay, so um, thank you, RSC, for this opportunity to present you and also my Rex for the invitation. And today we're going to share with you our efforts in developing a microRNA based tear diagnostic for diabetic macular edema. So the clinical need um, that we have for diabetic macular edema is that often as an ophthalmologist, in the clinic, we see a lot of patients coming in with diabetic macular edema. And this occurs in patients with diabetes. And what happens is that the, vet, the blood vessels in your eye gets leaky and, what, and then what results in a accumulation of fluid in the macula. So when we look into the eye, as you can see in the picture over here, patients have dot blot hemorrhages as well as exudates. And this results in a loss of central vision. And as we are all familiar with, diabetes is a major public health issue worldwide, approximately 450 million patients. And many of these patients go on to develop diabetic retinopathy, a subset of which about one sixth of these patients will develop diabetic macular edema. And indeed, diabetic macular edema is a leading cause of blindness in working adults. And 30% of these patients with diabetic macular edema eventually go on to develop moderate vision loss, affecting their work productivity, within three years. And in the clinic, currently our gold standard treatment would be anti-VEGF injection. As you can see here, it's pretty scary. Essentially what this involves is we put a needle into the patient's eye. And in the market right now, we have three um, agents that we can use, Avastin, Ilea, and Lucentis. Unfortunately, 25% um, of our patients are actually poor responders to this treatment. And 25% of our patients are non-responders. And what this means is despite numerous uh, injections over time, these patients do not have any improvement in their retinal thickness. And many of these patients need to have up to 10 injections per year. And that's pretty intensive. That means coming back almost every month for injection. And each injection will cost um, at least from a range of $40 to $1,200, depending on the kind of agents that we are using. 
Of course, there are alternative treatment modalities, one of which is Osodex, which is a dexamethasone-based uh, treatment. This also requires an injection into the eye with a larger ball needle, but this is a second-line treatment because there are other complications such as raised intraocular pressure and accelerated cataract formations. And in a subset of diabetic macular edema where we, it's non-foveal involving, we can also offer patients photocoagulation therapy. With intravitreal injections, every additional injection exposes the patient to a risk of one of the following complications. The most severe of which is anophthalmitis, which is a severe eye infection resulting in, in a loss of vision. And very rarely, sometimes uh, injection of medication in the eye can cause a sudden rise in the eye pressure. This is also uh, called glaucoma if it damages the nerves and it's potentially sight-threatening. Very rarely also, sometimes you can cause a retinal detachment or a cataract formation if we were to needle were to touch the retina or the lens, although this is really rare in our clinical practice. But very often what we can see is that patients develop subconjunctival hemorrhage, which is the picture that you can see there. Although it's quite harmless, but it um, sometimes can look quite scary. So the first question as a clinician um, that we wanted to address was, is there any way we can reduce the number of injections required by knowing which sort of patients respond better to injections? So currently in the clinical practice, Unfortunately, it's actually very challenging for us to predict response to anti vegf therapy. So this is an optical coherence tomography uh, picture of a patient of the back of the eye. You can see here the black spaces here are fluid accumulation within the layers of the retina. In this patient, we've given him one injection and the patient responded pretty well. You see the restoration of the foveal contour with very minimal fluid left and this results in good visual recovery. In another patient where you can see, again, similar amount of intraretinal fluid accumulation as well as heart exudates. In this patient, we give three injections. And despite the three injections, paradoxically, the intraretinal fluid actually increased and the patient did not have any improvement in visual acuity. So one might have thought that you know, these treatments are very effective and most of the patients respond well, as we can see in the first case. But actually, in clinical practice and in clinical studies, there is data to suggest that after six months of treatment in patients, up to 30 to 60% of them still have persistent diabetic macular edema, showing that there is a limited efficacy for these treatment for diabetic macular edema. So some of the questions we then went to ask was, is there any way we can predict the patients that are going to respond better and in that way be able to tailor our management better and and also, is there any way we can predict which treatment modality is preferred? So for example, if patients respond better to ILEA, maybe we can commence an ILEA treatment first. Or if we know that they are poor responders, perhaps we could add on the second line treatment, which is the steroid injection. So these were some of the questions that we sought to answer in our study. So as we looked around and thought of what sort of biomarkers we could be looking at, traditionally ophthalmologists, we look at imaging biomarkers. So they analyze the OCT images and try to see if they could predict response. So we wanted to go for an alternative method, which was to look at um, a more molecular approach of looking at a bio, using microRNA as a biomarker. And we did this because some studies have shown that microRNAs have played a role in ocular conditions. For example, in age-related macular degeneration, dry eyes, and glaucoma. Not so much has been done in the field of diabetic macular edema. And also microRNAs have been shown to play a role in many systemic conditions, particularly also in diabetes. So we thought that this might be a possible approach. And at that time when we started the study, uh, Myrex uh, was an up and coming um, biotech startup, but of course now they are very well established. So um, some of the uh, advantages of Myrex approach is that they have specific forward and reverse qPCR primers, mRNA specific RT primers, as well as the fact that they intercalate their uh, cybergreen, which allows the detection of qPCR products better. But of course, I'll leave this to the Myrex team to tell you more about the technology later. And then the other question we thought about was what sort of biofluids should we use for the biomarker discovery? Um, and obviously, TIRS was the first thing we thought about because it was non-invasive, it was easily collected. In the clinics, we can collect them using strips as shown, and then we can easily store the samples at minus 20 to minus 80. And of course, putting it through the Myrex uh, workflow, we can easily get the data in three hours. So it makes it a plausible way of integrating this into our clinical practice. 
And of course, tears is much better than sticking a needle into the eye to collect fluid from the aqueous or the vitreous. So it's non-invasive and this will definitely improve uh, patients' experiences and of course, enable us to attain faster regulatory approval if we do want to apply this to clinical practice. And as I will share with you later, we have data showing that the microRNA expression in tear is much better than that of aqueous, which is an intraocular fluid, as well as serum in the blood. And microRNAs are ideal biomarkers because they're highly stable. They're stable after multiple cycles of freeze thaw, and they can withstand changes in pH as well as stable in room temperature. And of course, as alluded to earlier, they have been shown to be involved in multiple um, pathways and pathophysiology in diabetic retinopathy, as well as in other systemic diseases. So they can be potentially developed as a platform technology for other forms of biomarker discovery for other clinical conditions. So the first question we sought to answer was, will TIA samples be a suitable source of biofluid for, oc for ocular microRNA biomarker discovery? And then the second question we sought to answer was, are we then able to identify a panel of microRNA markers that would be able to help us to stratify the outcome response of diabetic macular edema patients to the anti-VEGF treatment? So in our study design, is a prospective case series of patients with type 1 or type 2 diabetes. And these patients would be treatment naive, meaning they would not have received any prior form of treatment. They must have a significant visual loss and also a retinal thickness of more than 300 micrometers in the central subfield of the retina as shown by the OCT images that I've shown you earlier. And these study participants will receive either intravitreal bevacizumab, avastin, or aflibacet ilia into the eye. So the patients are given one injection at baseline and then subsequently every four weeks until there was a complete resolution of the retinal thickness. The tear samples were collected at baseline and every four weeks thereafter. And then at the end of the treatment um, period, we then grade the patients after a maximum injection of four injections, and then we grade them according to poor responders, partial responders, or good responders. This is a table showing the patient demographics. In total, we recruited 21 patients and 24 eyes. In the first batch of patients, we actually collected three different kinds of biofluids, one of which was tears, followed by aqueous, which is a fluid in the front part of the eye, and also blood. And in the second batch, we only collected tears from the patients. So the first question is whether tear samples will be a suitable source for a discovery of microRNA biomarkers. So in the data here, as you can see in the um, bar plots over here, that in the tear, we could detect the most amount of microRNAs, 315 which is even more than what we could detect in, this, in the serum of patients, which was very surprising for us. And that's more than double of what was detected in the aqueous. And in the Venn diagram over here, you can see that the um, microRNAs that are detected in the tears um, is a subset of serum and aqueous, showing that they are able to um, accurately reflect the identity of the microRNAs that are present in the intraocular fluid. And then this is a um, box plot showing the number of non-detects uh, in the three different kinds of biofluids. Here you can see that in the aqueous, there's a high number of non-detects, whereas in the tears, there's a fewer number of non-detects, showing that we will be able to have reproducible data if we were to use tears as a biofluid. And the PCA plot here, you can see that in the tears, they are very tightly clustered. Whereas in the aqua samples, they are kind of like dispersed around, again showing that there is a large intragroup variation. And therefore, in the aqueous, despite the fact that it's an intraocular fluid, there is less reproducibility. And tears, in contrast, will be a better source of fluid for biomarker discovery. So the next question we sought to identify, uh, we sought to answer was then to use tears to identify a panel of microRNA markers to help us to stratify the outcome of patients to treatment. So we looked at the tear samples of the 24 patients, and these tear samples were collected at the baseline prior to the starting of treatment. When we did a PCA plot, um, when we looked, when we compared the poor responders, the partial responders and the good responders, unfortunately, they were not able to cluster well. So in the final analysis, we only included the patients which are poor responders in blue and the good responders in red. And then we did an analysis to look at whether there were any microRNAs that were differentially expressed. 
And if you look at the heat map over here, we were able to identify at least uh, 30 microRNAs that were differentially expressed between these two groups. And the volcano plot here, you can see that those with the higher um, positive scores, load, higher positive loading scores, these are microRNAs that have higher expression in the good responders. And in the microRNAs with the high, higher negative scores, these are microRNAs that are more highly expressed in the poor responders. So then when we did a little bit more detailed analysis of uh, these microRNAs that were differentially expressed, within the group of the non-responders, the top three microRNAs had a positive Pearson correlation value with the uh, retinal thickness. What this meant was that with increasing microRNA expression, we could see that there was a larger reduction in the retinal thickness, meaning that the response to treatment was much better. In contrast, in the poor responders, the top three microRNAs have a negative Pearson correlation value. And what this means is that with increasing microRNA expression, you can see that there was a reduction in the reduction of the retinal thickness, meaning that the retinal thickness continued to increase despite treatment. So then we also wanted to look at what sort of pathways these microRNAs might be um, playing a role in. So we did a gene ontology as well as a CAC microRNA pathway enrichment analysis. The red circles there refer to the, uh, poor, the good responders and the blue circles refer to the poor responders. As you can see in the good responders, many of the microRNAs are involved in the retinopathy pathways as well as the VEGF pathways here at the bottom. And in the poor responders, Interestingly, um, some of the microRNAs are involved in TGF beta signaling pathway, as well as the insulin-like growth factor receptor pathway, which I will discuss a little bit later. And in the poor responders also, you can see here that there are lots of um, pathways that are related to inflammation. And what this indicates to us is that potentially for the poor responders, um, we should start on anti-inflammatory treatment or steroid treatment such as exomethasone at an earlier stage. So doing a little bit of a deep dive, uh, for the group responders, seven of the eight microRNAs that are enriched in the VEGF signaling pathway has been shown uh, to inhibit the VEGF as well as the VEGF receptor. And many of these microRNAs also target key um, downstream genes in the pathways of VEGF signaling, such as the PI3K, the MEPK, as well as the focal adhesion signaling pathways. And what we postulate is that maybe perhaps in this patients that are good responders, the microRNA expression has already kind of downregulated the VEGF pathway and that sensitizes them to subsequent anti-VEGF treatment. Interestingly, in the poor respondents, they, um, the microRNA seem to target a TGF beta pathway. And the TGF beta pathway can be divided into the, the anti-angiogenic as well as the pro-angiogenic effectors. And interestingly, the microRNAs here only target the anti-angiogenic effectors rather than the pro-angiogenic effectors. And so we postulate that potentially this could be an additional therapeutic target that we could look at for future drug development. And also, as mentioned earlier, the poor respond in the poor responders, the microRNAs also target the IGF-1 signaling pathway. And again, we postulate that this could be an alternative uh, route or alternative pathway for subsequent therapies to be targeted. So in conclusion, uh, we have found that here is indeed an in ideal biofluid for microRNA biomarker discovery. It's non-invasive, it's easily obtained, and microRNAs are very abundant and reproducible in the tiers compared to serum and aqueous, and it's a very, and microRNA is very stable and therefore amenable for uh, biomarker discovery. And we also identified 30 distinct microRNAs that help us to predict response to treatment and the sub-analysis of the six microRNAs correlate very well with the outcome um, in terms of the retinal thickness to treatment. And we also did a pathway analysis to show that these microRNAs have differential regulation of different pathways. And this shed light on the pathophysiology of DME as well as potentially suggest new therapeutic targets. However, one of the main limitations of our study is that we have a really small sample size and hopefully we will be able to do further studies to validate um, this, our results in independent cohorts. I'd like to thank my lab, in particular uh, Paul, who did most of the, uh, uh, who is the biothematician, who did most of the analysis of our work, as well as Pincia, who uh, contributed a lot to the writing up of the manuscript. Right. That, like, thank you, and I can take any questions. Thank you very much, Singy, for the very insightful uh, um, presentation. Um, so we're waiting for uh, 
folks to raise a question. Actually, we have a, a, a couple coming in. Uh, maybe I'll, I'll take the very first, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, ask the very first question. So um, in your work, you also um, um, have patients who are, you know, male, female. Uh, have you actually looked at um, the, in, in terms of outcomes in gender stratification? Um, is there a difference there? Yeah, unfortunately we didn't because we felt that the numbers were too little for us to be able to do a good gender stratification, but that's something we should definitely look into when we do a larger study. Right, right. Yeah. Okay, uh, so maybe we'll just take some questions from the floor. Uh, some are quite, um, you know, uh, asking about collection of tears from patients. Uh, yeah. Is there a particularly um, good way to do that? Maybe if I could just share my screen again. So basically in a clinic, we use Sherman strips, which I've shown in the presentation earlier, which is essentially a strip that we place in the canvas of the eye. And then by capillary action, um, the tears will be collected onto the strip of paper. And then later on, you can extract the tears from the Sherman strip. Okay, so uh, there's another question about uh, tear fluids that also contains microni diagnostic for comorbidities, comorbidities um, so possibly undiagnosed. So is this evident in your clinical data? So I, I think in, in our patients, we didn't really look at what are some of the other comorbidities. I mean, we minimally, um, know that they are diabetics, but we didn't look at whether the other comorbidities are related to the microRNA expression. So we didn't do that analysis. Anyway, our patient sample was too little for us to have any meaningful data in, in that way. Right. So the follow-up question for that uh, uh, person, uh, so Dave, David, um, uh, is that, uh, is this tear fluids, uh, you know, localized, microRNA is localized in the uh, extracellular vesicles? Or, or do you think they're naked? I, I don't know, actually, because I'm not, I'm not sure how, whether they are localized or that they are naked. Yeah, maybe, so- Maybe so, Jit, so, you can help to answer since you are- <laughs> Right, right, right. So, so the, 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 the process is that, uh, that there isn't any enrichment for uh, um, exosome or extracellular vesicles. Yeah, so um, uh, the uh, RNA extraction is made, you know, just uh, you know, using the uh, the samples, right? Uh, tears, uh, serum, as well as uh, the the aqueous fluids, right? Um, so uh, uh, there is no uh, particular requirement for um, enrichment of uh, uh, these exosome uh, or extracellular vesicle uh, associated microns, but um, doing those um, additional steps uh, may provide certain advantage like, you know, increasing signal to noise ratio, uh, but not extremely or uh, necessary. I maybe um, I can take the next question. I think from Amit Singhal said that the anti-VEGF is also used for AMD. Can we then use microRNA to predict responses? I think that's an excellent question. Yes, we can. Um, I, I think the limitation is just in terms of recruitment of patients uh, for biomarker discovery, but yes, definitely we can do that. Uh, there's another question I'm asking about the, the volume. Uh, how much do you need for, uh, for tears, you know, to, to detect up to 300 microRNA? Um, so it's very hard to determine by volume because when we collect the tears, it's on this strip of paper. So we kind of look, we calculate by millimeters. So we measure the amount of sweat that is collected onto the, on the sugar strip. And actually, it's very minimal amount of fluid. I think if you were to elute out, I think we're talking about like maybe five microliters, 10 microliters amount. Yeah, so it's minimal amount. Right. So, so Max has a question uh, asking if there's any correlation of your results with the uh, proteomic and metabolomic studies of tears? Um, so unfortunately there isn't that much um, looking into the tears of patients with diabetic macular edema. So um, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't know that much if there was a very good correlation. <laughs> so, but that's an excellent question. I think I would look into it. Yep. 
So are there any other questions from the floor? Actually, I'm just curious. Uh, so Dr. Su, so what are the major challenges that you have faced um, during this experiment and how were they overcome? Challenges. I, I think yeah. for us, the most challenging part was actually recruiting a sufficient number of patients for the study. Um, in terms of the scientific, I mean, the lab part of it is pretty straightforward because we collected the tear samples on the Schumer strip and then we sent them over to Myrex and then they actually did the illusion. Um, they help us optimize the illusion of the microRNAs from the Schumer strips. Uh, and then they actually also did a preliminary um, analysis of the data of which we then subsequently did a deeper analysis. So in the, from the practical aspect, it was actually pretty straightforward. Ah, I see. But what will make you think of looking into microRNA in this, in this, you know, yeah, in this study? Um, so we actually started this study quite some time ago, it was at least four to five years ago when we started recruiting patients. At that time, microRNA was like the new, new thing oh. on the block. And then we, we heard about Myrex, we thought, why not we try to look for, or try to work with them? So that was the reason why we started on the project. Okay. Okay, thank you for the answer. Um, so is there any more questions from the floor? Oh, there's one question that asks about correlation as well. I'm not sure if that has been answered. So by Shamian Chia, what about correlation with vitreous fluid? This should be the direct fluid that reflect the edema. Yeah, so that's a very good question. I mean, it, one would have thought that the fluid that is from within the eye would reflect the pathology the best. But unfortunately, we didn't get the ethics approval to obtain vitreous fluid because it's very invasive. Uh, we, we, you need a large bone needle to obtain sufficient fluid and then there's the additional risk of infection and retinal detachment. So in the end, we only had ethics approval to get aqueous fluid, which is from the front of the eye. And that was the closest that we could get to a so-called intraocular fluid as a source of comparison. So that's why we were very surprised that actually uh, tears, in tears, we were able to pick up more microRNA and it was more, and you know, the number of microRNAs, so the identity of microRNAs was exactly overlapped with that of the uh, aqueous. So we thought that would be a good surrogate. So, see what what are the uh, the next steps that you you have uh, in mind, you know, to to advance the uh, the the study. Well, if we have sufficient funding, <laughs> we'll definitely definitely be keen to look into a larger group of patients to validate our findings. Right. Okay, so if there's uh, no other question, uh, uh, you know, I really like to thank uh, Singy again for the excellent talk. Uh, so next up, uh, I'd like to invite uh, uh, Lavi Gallagher, the uh, Vice President of uh, Strategy and Growth Ops uh, of Merexis to join us. Lavi is a new uh, addition to Merexis, coming to us from, uh, you know, with about uh, 20 years of uh, experience in, you know, at ABI, uh, Live Technologies, as well as uh, Illumina. He's going to walk us through um, the technology and services that help support uh, Singhi's uh, research. Lobby, please. Wait, can you hear me okay? Yes. Hey, thank you, Dr. Sue, for inviting us and, and supporting us along the way. Really appreciate it. And thank you, Jocelyn, for your tech support and help with setting up the call. I really appreciate that as well. Um, please stick around to the end of this discussion. It's only going to be a couple minutes more. Uh, we've got some uh, offers for you at the end. Um, but I wanted to walk you through some of the technologies supporting Dr. Sue's research. Um, so Merexis is microRNA focused, but it's not the only thing we do. And in fact, uh, if you've gotten a COVID test here in Singapore, you probably have been tested using our uh, qPCR assay for SARS-CoV-2 testing. But uh, the thing we're going to focus on today are the life sciences products that are focused on microRNA uh, discovery. So we won't be talking about the diagnostics, we won't be talking about the development um, that we do for other customers, but focusing more on the discovery and um, our attachment to translational research. So just a brief reminder that we, we do come from ASTAR. We have a long and, and storied history with NUS and ASTAR. Um, and so one of our founders, uh, Dr. Tu, is part of our scientific advisory board along with Dr. Lam, Dr. Yo, and Dr. Tan, um, along with the researcher over in the US, Dr. Slack, who was one of the co-founders of the first human microRNA. 
um, and Dr. Ochia in Japan, who leads up basically the biggest microRNA efforts in Japan. So all of these people are part of our scientific advisory board. Now, uh, one of the key things, this may not be super interesting as most of you are already really comfortable with real-time PCR, but I wanted to run through a little bit about what's different about uh, Merexis's qPCR technology compared to some of the, the big competitors out there with Kaijin and, and ABI. So all of those other companies at some point in their qPCR work use universal primers, so random primers or, or universal primers in priming their PCR or real-time PCR or, or reverse transcription reverse transcription reaction. Uh, Merexis is different in as much as we use uh, microRNA specific primers for every step of the qPCR reactions, which means that you really do have unparalleled specificity um, and sensitivity. So typically what can be worrisome in real-time reactions is that you may use random primers to help increase overall yield and boost signal a little bit. But in this case, by using microRNA specific primers along with speci uh, specific buffers, we find that we're really, really good at detecting the low quantities of microRNA. What that means is uh, you end up with detection several CT values earlier, uh, several cycles earlier than some of our competitors. So in this case, with a comparison between these microRNA listed below, um, ranging in AT percentages, so relatively high GC down to high AT, um, you can see that we're able to pick up signal several cycles earlier compared to some of the competitors. Now, when it comes to specificity, uh, off-target uh, off amplification is a concern because you do have fairly high conservation between microRNAs. So here you see the LET7 family, uh, and you see that it's pretty heavily conserved. So white regions are 100% conserved, blue regions are partially conserved, um, and the green regions slightly less so. So um, in general, you see very little crosstalk ag across family members, with the exception being the LET7 um, B and C crosstalk just above the third column, the third row, third column, so sorry, third column, second row, a 2.2% detection in crosstalk across family members, but otherwise you get no target at all being amplified in other family members. What that means is that, uh, so in this case, this was uh, small serum samples where we were able to detect several hundred novel microRNA in near picogram quantities of uh, input RNA. So what this means is that we're able to detect a lot of novel things that typically wouldn't be picked up because of that increased sensitivity. Now we do have the single assays that use that technology, which, which I showed in the previous slides, uh, and we've put them into some knowledge panels. So that's where we do a little bit of the legwork in selecting microRNA for your review. So we have one that is a uh, cancer panel, a biofluid panel, which is a slightly abbreviated version, but these are uh, microRNA that have been previously associated with different kinds of cancer and have a pretty large literature history and publishing history. And then we have the Panoramir platform, the branded platform, which is a pan disease platform. Um, it's really quick. It's between two to three and a half hours, depending on whether or not you're going to do pre-amplification. Um, but using the system allows you to screen microRNA uh, really quickly in, in a hypothesis-free RNA, uh, uh, hypothesis-free way, kind of like sequencing does. So um, these are some of the microRNA that are associated and the diseases that they're associated with. So there's a little bit of overlap. Again, there are 376 microRNA, excuse me, I need to close the panel of people it's covering up my slides. Um, so there's 376 microRNA targets, but they're associated with these different diseases, whether it's cardiovascular disease, metabolic disease, neurological, and so on. Um, so they've been characterized, and then we do the annotations for you. Beyond that, if you don't have the resources in your own lab, or um, like I myself am not lucky enough to have my own bioinformatician, uh, if your lab doesn't have one either, uh, we do offer services that will allow you to do this screening and profiling. So Dr. Sue was using our ideal uh, profiling service and um, she was looking, I uh, can't remember exact, the exact number of biomarkers at the time, I think it was about 320 biomarkers and we've increased that uh, and gone a little bit further over time up to 700 different biomarkers. So we do offer this service, which will, we have a Q, Q, uh, 
real-time PCR service. We also have an NGS service available, uh, so next-gen sequencing. And um, we can look at your microRNA in lots of different ways and give you the bioinformatic analysis as well. So really from the early consultation and getting you set up with designing your experiment um, into the actual uh, profiling it itself using real-time PCR or next-gen sequencing, and then going on to the bioinformatics, we, we do offer everything up into the results report that you can then use for, for doing your own analysis. Now, when it comes to uh, the analytics, there are a lot of different things. I think you saw some elements in Dr. Sue's presentation around clustering analysis, uh, the volcano plot that you saw, and trying to see what's being upregulated or downregulated in your samples. Um, we have a lot of different ways that we can give you feedback and give you ideas about what you may be experiencing in your samples. So again, it's kind of hypothesis free. You go in and, and you say, I've got these two different disease states um, and I wanna figure out what's different about them. How do, how do, I, how do I figure out what may be going on. So you give us the sample and we'll give you an indication of what's going on and, and how it may be affecting your uh, particular samples. So as promised, um, I just wanted to make it quick and, and not overload load you with a marketing pitch. Uh, we do have a couple things that I do wanna offer today. So we are offering a qPCR starter kit. Um, so if you would go ahead and email us at sales at merexis.com, uh, and if you just help us out and put starter kit in the subject line, we may be able to figure it out otherwise, but we do get a lot of email and I wanna make sure that we pay attention to you. Um, and we'll review your email and talk to you a little bit about your plan and we can send you a starter kit, which has two assays uh, that include your reverse transcription primers and qPCR primers and your master mixes as well. Uh, that'll let you do reactions for 20 cDNA synthesis reactions and 100 qPCR reactions. And the other thing is, you know, uh, we're happy to consult with you and talk about that profiling service. And um, we've got, again, a promo here as well. So if you want to email us and use that promo code listed at the bottom, Marexis and RSC, so that's an ampersand there. Uh, if you include that code, uh, we'll give you 15% off your project as well. So we want to make sure that uh, we appreciate you for coming out today and make sure that you get a little bit of extra benefit just besides knowledge. So thank you very much. And if you have any questions, feel free to shoot something in the chat box now. Thank you very much, Lobby. Any questions from Flo? I will leave this screen up for a moment uh, so people can write this stuff down. Um, but thank you again for coming. Thank you, Dr. Sue. Thank you, Jocelyn, for taking care of us. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Lavi. All right, thanks a lot. Okay, now let me um, just take a quick flash, quick flash of the QR code. Okay. 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 So before we end, do take some time to do this survey for us so that we know what we can uh, consider for our next upcoming webinars next year.
So once again, thank you everyone for your time. Thank you, Marexis. Thank you, Doreen. Thank you, Dr. Su. Thank you, Lavi. And thank you, Dr. Jit. Thank you very much for having thank us. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.